Hello and welcome to the Game Dev London podcast. Uh, I'm Chris Payne and with me are Ian Thomas and Rachel Thomas. And today we're going to be talking about live role play uh, and the ways in which the design of that feeds into video games. So uh, welcome Ian and Rachel. Hi there. So I want to kick off uh, Ian with um, maybe how did you and Rachel get into uh, running live role play events? Sure. Uh... At university, uh, probably over, is it over 25 years yet? It's, it's something like that, way back in the early 90s. Um, I'd got into live role-playing via um, my brother and a bunch of other people in the quite early days uh, of it, um, where it was very much wander along a path, meet some bad guys, hit them, wander along, meet some more bad guys, hit them. Um, and I took that with me to, to university and, and myself and a, a, a few other people, including uh, Rachel, set up a, uh, a club and society there that's called the Cuckoo's Nest and it's still going. Um, primarily, I think, so we could have some budget from the, um, uh, from the university. Uh, and yes, we've been doing it ever since, off and on, in all sorts of scales um, from... Um, being involved in uh, running small to medium events, sort of um, anything from eight people to a hundred people, uh, and being involved in in helping to run or write um, systems with up to sort of three and a half thousand. So um, the whole gamut and everything from fantasy through, um, well, anything really, uh, sci-fi and horror and um, at pulp adventure and um, all sorts of bits and pieces. So uh, just for the benefit of people who are not familiar with uh, live role play, um, how would you how would you describe it? Do you want to take that, Rachel? <laughs> how would we describe it? It has been described in various different ways by various different people. I think my first description is always it's the ultimate escapism in that you're you're not only doing something different from your daily life, you're being someone different from your daily life. So to you dress up and act out a character who either is somebody you design in the game world or somebody given to you by the organizers. And rather than as you would in tabletop role playing, you, you would say, I walk down the path or I stop and talk to these people and I say in live role playing, you just do it. So you you walk up to people, you have a conversation with them as your character. So it has variously been described as cross-country pantomime or improvisational theatre without an audience. Um, but it's it's basically an immersive game. So you assume the role and persona of somebody else and you experience the world through their eyes. Uh, so yeah, I, I've always thought the best way to explain it from coming at it from a video games perspective is that it's like an MMO in a field. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it kind of varies. I mean, that that's for the large scale stuff, but it can yeah. be uh, a really intimate thing with three people in a room somewhere. You know, it, it's um, that's true. It, it really it, it really varies, and the level of immersion varies as well. It can be that everything within your site. Is absolutely perfect to the time period and the setting, um, or it can be that you're doing a lot of work in your imagination, um, and uh, you know items are printed on pieces of cardboard or things like that. But the the important part of it compared to something like tabletop gets quite close to tabletop. But the important distinction, I think, is is the physicality. Um, is mm. that you're you're going through the motions, I guess. So, what's it like? Um, what's your process for designing uh, live events? Well. Um, We've talked about this a bit. This is something that we developed accidentally, really, through running live role-playing events and then discovered that it works for other things like um, film, TV, uh, video games, um, which uh, is pretty straightforward. We always concentrate on um, what is the player going to feel? What's their experience going to be um, in every moment? Um, what are they going to be seeing and reacting to? So rather than going, let's come up with a story, and then let's put that story out in front of the players. 
it is let's come up with a series of experiences that are going to happen to the player and that for us is a wish list right at the beginning of any project if if we pick a, a random genre for example um, we recently did the three musketeers so we went through a whole bunch of three musketeers and associated source material and went we'd really like the players to feel like this we want them to feel like they've just um saved the king of france we want them to um, have a fight in a tavern and be able to break glasses over people's heads or hit people with chairs. We want them to actually feel like they're a character in those movies and they're doing things that the people in those movies would do. So we ran through, I think, probably 150 of those ideas as a shopping list. And that's what we'll do at the start of every project. We'll, we'll just com completely come up with this, this shopping list of things. And then we'll look through it and see what's feasible. We'll talk to art departments, stunt departments, um, we'll figure out how we're going to deliver them. And they, they can be uh, fixed moments, like your big set pieces, um, or they can be the opportunity to have a moment, if that makes sense. So uh, leaving, um, I don't know, uh, leaving a pair of pistols in a box lying about in case anybody wants to have a duel, or, or that sort of thing. You can, you can sort of seed these things out, or they can be run at a specific place and time. And that's what we build the event around. We'll figure out which of those uh, moments make sense, how we might string them together into a, a sensible story. Uh, then we start thinking about plot arcs and characters and what characters we need and character motivations we need to deliver those moments and make them all make sense. But fundamentally, it's about what do we want the players to be coming out of this event and going, that was amazing, that bit when, and telling everybody about. And it, those war stories is, is, is really our motivation is, is to think about what people will be talking about and make sure that we hit those notes. Yeah. So as to how we actually physically do this process, um, it started as a bunch of post-it notes. We got, we wrote down all the moments, all the events, all the themes and feelings we wanted on post-it notes, stuck them all over a wall or a floor or a kitchen table or whatever flat surface was to hand. Um, and gradually organise them into themes and a branching linear story. Um, it's progressed slightly from that in that we now use an electronic post-it note board, um, but that still forms the, the basic structure of the event. We collect all those moments and then we lay them out and move them around and try and work out where it makes sense and maybe colour code them so that we can see themes or characters running through the narrative. So um, what about coming up with the player um, character ideas? Because uh, generally for live roleplay events, um, players create their own characters. But um, do you want to talk a bit about how you how you manage that in, in order to get the players to interact in an interesting way? Sure. So we tend to write, these days, uh, we tend to write uh, one-off standalone events. Um, and the idea that somebody will create a character to go and fit into that world um, purely off their own bat means that they arrive with no connections to anything else that's going on. They don't have any um, drama that they're going to have with other characters um, who they already know, you know, their nemeses, this kind of thing. That isn't going to happen if they just turn up and start playing. And they've only got a limited time because we're doing a one off event of maybe three, four days. Um, so we try and uh, find a shape of a character for them and how we do that these days we, we used to write quite comprehensive character briefs but that didn't really work um, because there wasn't any there wasn't enough contribution from the player and because they're always worried about forgetting things or doing it wrong um, so we use this this thing that we call the tag system where essentially um, the player suggests a bunch of things that they would like their character uh, character attributes um, which might be recurring nightmares or enemy of the king or you know any any of these little defining phrases and it might only be three or four of those phrases um, often choosing from a list that we've created that's appropriate to the genre but they can suggest things as well then they send that to us um, we look at it have a bit of a think about it maybe put some more suggestions back to them and, and come up with a very very simple sort of top line uh, character for them and then um, we write the game based on that list of tags if they are enemy of the king we don't actually really need to know a great deal more about their background but we are going to make sure that there's a plot which involves that for example if they are 
um, a heretic um, or part of the, the Templar organization or something like that. We'll make sure that that sort of stuff is in there. Or if they've, they've uh, you know, um, got a forbidden love or something like that. I mean, generally, we'll encourage the players to talk to each other. Um, and something like Forbidden Love, they might set up a, a, a relationship with somebody else who um, also wants to play that, that kind of game, and we'll make sure we give them opportunity to play that stuff out. But fundamentally, it's a, a collaboration between us and them um, coming up with a, a, a character that already has connections because those connections are so important to give you drama and you know uh, tears and anger and whatever during the, the actual play. And and how do you deliver that to the player once that once you've crafted all of that background? So one of the things that we use to to deliver these moments to the players is to actually create them letters and ID cards and physical things to give them a a better sense of who their character is and also to give them something that they can use in the game for example we, we know players are worried about forgetting things um for grim which was our 1950s ghost story we gave all of them an id card which had photos on them but also had where they lived their job their occupation information about themselves so if they needed something to refer to in the game to try and work out how old they were or where they lived they had a physical prop that they could bring out in game to look at which prompted them to remember um, and it also means that it, they have a a thing which is in game can be left lying around can be read or looked at by other players so if you have letters to your secret lover well either you have to carry them around but even if they're in your bag you might put that down someone might look at them um, you might leave them on your bedside table, which is you know, something that good and game spirited players often will because that allows the sharing of secrets. And we all know in, in game that secrets are far better if they're shared by the people who should know, plus at least one other person. So you leave things around, the servants might find it. Someone might walk into your room to get a pen and, and stumble across your secret correspondence or the locket you were given by your mother, or some other physical memento, which prompts a question, or starts a story, or just gives players more interaction. So the a physical form, rather than a slip of paper that says you were sent a letter by the colonel in charge of your regiment, send them the letter that was sent by the colonel in charge of the regiment, stating that you know they fled in the face of danger or were court-martialed for something or some sort of incriminating evidence or at least a story to come out. That must take a while to create all those props. <laughs> yes. Uh, Grimm in particular nearly broke us um, because we spent several months writing the character packs for players and including letters and photographs and maps of the air routes that they used to fly whilst doing postal delivery in Canada and North America and newspaper articles and penguin books written by their author character and all sorts of background information um, which was fantastic but we went a bit over the top on that one. Yeah I think something like 571 pieces of paper or something went out most of them customized to the individual people wow. so yeah it was quite a lot of work yeah and that was for about 25 players something like that yeah yeah Good grief. yeah and i know rachel you have a particular interest in the um uh the uh the economics of uh making these sorts of events viable at at, at various different scales don't you yes um i think a lot of these these events are done for love and done as a hobby um, and with something like that it has to be because there's absolutely no way you could make that economically viable unless you were charging tens of thousands of pounds if you actually break down the the hours that are spent in these things 
it becomes utterly unaffordable to most people who would be interested in playing. Yeah. Um, the uh, with the Musketeers event that we ran recently, all for one, we actually kept we kept a log of how many hours we worked on the game and worked out what the ticket prices should have been at various different payment points of key staff and monsters or supporting cast and um, prop makers and it took the ticket price from about £350 including food and accommodation if you actually paid um, your experts a reasonable wage and everybody else a living wage it was about £7,000 a ticket or it would have been which certainly wow. limits your target audience okay. so I think there, there is a balance and I think players have to realise what they're getting for their money and actually in most cases what a bargain they're actually getting and partly it's because the people who are running this event want want to run it and they're, they're steeped in the hobby and they want everyone to have a great experience but there are people trying to run commercially and I think you can you can run more commercially by repeating events and using the same props and costumes and player handouts and things that you've generated. Um, but if you want a bespoke experience, then it is a luxury item and should come with that sort of price tag attached. Um, yeah. I, I've written a series of blog posts about this and broken down different uh, price structures and compared it to other entertainments if, if people are interested in looking at that um, but there's I think it's it's fascinating and anyone who can make a good living from running individually tailored role-playing games has found some magic system that I haven't yet yeah challenging um, so Ian could you um, could you walk us through an example of a of creating uh, a particular uh, memorable moment from from one of your games yeah I know that I know the one you have in mind because I always roll this out um, simply because it's a it's a really good um, design example um, and apologies for anybody um, who's heard me talk about it before um, so this was a, a moment from our 1950s uh, ghost story Christmas ghost story um, and the idea is <clears throat> excuse me you are in bed it is 3 a.m uh, the lights on in your room um, because you couldn't turn it off because you were so scared you, you didn't want to um, he didn't want to turn it off um, you're lying in bed with your partner um, you haven't slept properly for the last couple of days because the this place is haunted um, you're relatively sure by now it's haunted you've heard the the bumps in the night and you've heard people see that they say that they've seen strange things um, and this room was a bit weird anyway uh, when you came into it it's a um, a bedroom that used to belong to a young couple. You can tell that from the, the photographs around the room. Um, you've heard that a young couple died here some years ago, but you don't really know the details. Um, however, you've uh, found things like um, the these photographs, there are old newspaper clippings, there uh, is a dried um, bridal bouquet, um, and there's a crib over in the corner of the room with a wooden sign on it saying Gwendolyn, um, and there's a photo of a baby. And uh, this tragedy yeah, that, that you vaguely heard about was something to do with this couple and this baby. Um, and you've heard strange things as well, noises. You've heard a baby crying in the house, muffled through the walls, but you've never been able to find it. Um, and you could swear you heard a gunshot at one point and maybe a couple arguing. But there was maybe a spot of blood in the bathroom, but the servants tidied that up and there's nothing else been seen. But now 3 a.m., um, Suddenly, you hear a gunshot, um, bang, um, from the corridor outside and a scream and a baby crying. And the door bursts open and this young woman bursts into the room. Um, she's wearing a black dress. She's been crying. You can see tears, makeup down her face. Um, under one arm, she has the baby. You can hear it um, crying. And in the other hand, she's got a pistol. Uh, and she runs into the room, distraught. 
Uh, and you recognise her. She's the girl from the photographs. As far as you know, she's she's dead. She must be a ghost, I guess. Um, but you don't really have time to think about it before she's running into the room, running away from the people who are pursuing her. You can't see anybody pursuing her, but she, clearly she can. And she runs over to the window, waving the pistol past you as she goes, distraught, doesn't seem to see you, opens the window and pulls up the sash of the window and throws the baby out. And at this point, you're, you're two stories up, I think. At this point, you're, as a player, if you can get yourself out of your immediate sense of panic, hopefully as a player, you might go, it's all right, it's not real, it's not a real baby, it's just a dummy, There's, this is all just a setup. this is a role-playing game, I'm not really a 1950s character. At which point she jumps out of the window. And by the time you've recovered yourself and got over to the window and looked down, there's nothing below. No no baby, no girl, uh, nothing down there at all. Um, and so uh, I think when we really ran this, actually the people in the bedroom ran away uh, pretty rapidly. <laughs> um, but And whether they managed to stop to, to, to think as far as I was just describing there in terms of the baby being fake, that kind of thing, oh, who knows. Um, but... There's some interesting design things going on, on there, which actually do apply to, to computer games to a certain extent. Um, so the trick, um, the the vanishing of the woman, that was the uh, the stunt performer's idea. She wanted to jump out of a window. That was where we started with the moment. They, the stunt team came to us and said, we'd love to jump out of a window, and we think we can make somebody disappear. Hooray, great, let's do that. And so we, we sat down to plan that out, and we, we figured out what room it might need to be in for safety, that sort of thing. And then the stunt team said, you know, if there's going to be people in the bed, it might be difficult to stop them getting involved. If, if somebody's going to open the window and jump out, how do we stop them getting involved, tackling her, stopping her, doing what she's going to do? Um, and we, we threw around some ideas for a bit and then thought that one of the ideas might be to put some sort of barrier between the bed and the window, just the layout of the room, to stop them getting there. And there happened to be a cot a few rooms down. And so somebody said, well, why don't we use the cot? We could nail that to the floor and it'll be fine. That oh. Oh, does that mean that they've got a baby? Oh, there might be a baby involved. And then somebody came up with the gag that um, the baby goes out first and that, that kind of bluff thing about, oh, it's it's definitely not real and they're only throwing a dummy out the window, um, which is great and gives us some backstory for the character about the baby. Why is she throwing a baby out the window? What's happened there? But then the stunt team said again, but the, the issue with that is now there's a baby involved. They're even more likely to jump out of bed and get involved. Uh, and so somebody came up with the idea of the gun because a, a real looking gun waved past your face, particularly one that you've just heard shot, is likely to dissuade you just long enough for the woman to, to make the jump. And so we, we that was the core of it. And we came up with the backstory. We came up with the couple, what they were arguing about, the reason this woman was, was doing this thing. And that gave us our ghost. Um, but the interesting thing from a design point of view is we in several stages by having her being a ghost by putting in the crib by putting in the gun by making sure that they were just really scared of everything that was going on anyway we gradually shut down their options and made it much less likely that they were going to take an action that we didn't want them to take um, of course it wasn't totally uh, safe but we um, made it so that they felt that they couldn't take that action but we also made it by doing those things that they felt that they didn't take the action because they chose not to, because they were too scared, because they were too cowardly to get out of bed and get involved. Mm -hmm. And that means that we haven't made the mistake, which is we've certainly made in games before, which certainly computer games um, often seem to make of, of railroading. You get to a point where there's a choice of some sort in a game where, because of production realities, because of whatever it is, you can only let them take two choices. You can't let them do the third thing or the fourth thing or the fifth thing um, because you just can't support that from a production point of view. And in, we had very much the same thing there. We had no plan for what would happen if they tackled the, the well, the stunt team did, but we, it was going to be far less effective. Um, and so by getting the player into the right mindset, we it meant that they didn't feel that we had said no. Whereas in a computer game, I mean, going back to the old point and click things, for example, um, you click on something, you can't use that item. Now, if you can find a way in which the player has no desire to take that sideways action and they feel that it is their choice to do the other action, that's brilliant because they feel that they've had freedom and it's entirely down to them. Rachel, you have uh, an example of uh, 
achieving the uh, the holy grail of uh, live role play, which is horses on the field. Yes, it only took me 25 years, but we did manage to, <laughs> to get horses. Our All for One, our Musketeers event had horses. Um, and it was, we kept thinking about horses and how could we get horses and how could we make it safe? Because a horse is 500 kilograms of unpredictable large animal with metal weapons attached to its feet, which is not really what you want in a, a crowd of people who are likely to be moving and shouting and again, unpredictable. So we, we thought musketeers have horses and musketeer films have horses and we'd, we'd really like to put horses in this. Um, so we wondered how we could go about it. And we, we broke the event down so that we, we had musketeers in training and therefore they were in small groups and they had a um, school timetable. So we knew where each of these groups were going to be at particular times. Often they were supervised by a non-player character. So someone we as the organizers could brief and control and who could know what to expect. Um, and we looked at the structure of the event and thought, well, we have this old fashioned linear area. We have a, pla a path that the players are going to walk down. We know what they're going to encounter. We know the layout of this thing. Um, so we can put the horses at a sufficient distance or moving in a way that we know exactly where and when they're going to encounter the players and, and we're in control. So we don't have 200 people who are suddenly going to charge over a hill and, and arrive behind the horses and spook them. Um, so we thought, yeah, we can, we can probably do this. And I spoke to a friend of mine who, was, who lives locally to Monmouth, where, where the event was, um, and asked if she knew anywhere we could hire horses. And she said, oh, I can bring mine. That's not a problem. Um, and went from Oh well, yes, okay. I'll I'll wear, yeah, I'll wear some costume if you provide it. To oh, I made some some leather bridles and some saddle straps for the horses, so they look like the ones in the BBC Musketeers program. Uh, to that was amazing. How can I do this again? So I think we have a, a convert here. Um, she really enjoyed herself, but we we knew where the horses were going to be. We knew where the players were going to be. Um, I timetabled all of this on the massive spreadsheet which allowed us to organise the event and then two days beforehand I realised that I'm, I timetabled the horses at the same point as we were having black powder firing muskets with other groups of players in the next field um, and that involved a hasty rewrite because we decided that even very well behaved horses shouldn't be put in a position where black powder is going off next to them. Um, so that removed that element of unpredictability and threat. Um, we sent the players a briefing sheet which had a disclaimer about being in an agricultural area, therefore there might be livestock and we would expect them to behave in these appropriate ways. So we hoped we'd implanted the idea that you needed to be careful without actually telling anyone that we had horses. Um, and then yeah, we, we positioned them in such a way that the players came along a path and turned a corner and there was Lord Buckingham with his two messages and horses behind. Or we knew the players were coming in a certain direction so we could canter the horses up to them full pelt and stop far enough away that we were certain that we could stop. But the players didn't know that. So <laughs> again, you had this this large noisy threat arriving very quickly into your field of view. And it enables us to do something that we, we have often talked about doing in our events, which is to allow the players to experience what their characters are feeling. So if the players were surprised or threatened or scared by the horses, that reinforced what their characters were feeling as well. So it, it's yeah. far easier to to express an emotion if that's actually the emotion that you're feeling. 
yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty fundamental to a lot of stuff that we do is uh, try and make the characters and the players feel the same thing, and, and that, again, applies to, to um, computer games as well. Um, and also the element of surprise is really important, um, and that doesn't necessarily mean just because we're going to spook somebody or something like that or frighten them. It's also delight, right? Because you have moments where if you'd known that that thing, particular thing was going to come, you you... It would have been great, and you'd have enjoyed it, but there isn't quite the same delight. The the other Musketeers one that immediately comes to mind, um, other than them being able to fire black powder weapons without expecting to, um, was the tavern brawl uh, sequence, uh, which our brilliant prop and stunt team um, set up, and they had trained all the players as um, uh, as part of the the in game training to brawl with each other, but they hadn't told them why they were teaching them this brawling and this safety. Um, and yeah, they they uh, they were sent by D'Artagnan into um, the local tavern uh, to um, steal their food, essentially, because they'd run out of money. Um, and it was straight out of the movies, and the place was full of stunt people and lots and lots of safe furniture of various sorts, things like foam chairs and a, a big foam chandelier hanging from the ceiling with a with a rope just obvious enough so you knew you could if you could see it, pull it and drop it on somebody's head. Um, lots of breakaway glasses, um, sugar glass you could smash over people's heads, and basically beforehand we took them aside and said, okay, now you've seen what this scene is, everything in there is safe, all of the people involved are stunt players, they're absolutely happy to, to have happen to them, whatever you want to happen to them, go. And just the, the, the giggling as they realised what they were about to be able to do, um, and the sort of unfettered nature of it, I suppose, um, was just... Yeah, that that was that was joyful, and we would have if we'd told them that and given them lots of you know leaflets beforehand saying what they were supposed to do and how they were supposed to behave, it just wouldn't have had the same effect. And they wouldn't be telling stories about it now, you know, whenever yeah. they see people. That's brilliant, uh, and of course, as you say, that um, uh, that philosophy applies to uh, video games as well. And I know that you've worked with uh, Frictional on uh, some of their horror games and uh, done a lot of work of that ilk with with creating scary situations player yeah um that that idea that you are trying to uh make the player feel the emotion rather than make the character that the player is playing feel the emotion and it doesn't have just have to be fear anything um it's just lingers so much more and it's so much more effective in in, in my view and, and and much more immersive and we, we always try to work that way um specifically in horror uh, and actually in other genres as well but specifically in horror the trick appears to be um about making them use their imagination about sketching things out for them, uh, about not showing them the monster, showing them the outline suggestion of the monster. It's why Jaws works as a brilliant horror film and why Alien worked as a, a, a brilliant horror film, which is just Jaws in space. Um, but, uh, and, and that was an accident, right? Because Jaws, the rubber shark didn't work properly, so they didn't, um, they weren't able to show it as much as they wanted to. And great, you add some brilliant music um, and uh, and just show it whenever you can. Um, but that's great because it means that the player is doing all the work for you. So if in a computer game you've made a, a pretty terrible model, shroud it in darkness, throw in a bit of fog, exactly the same as with a, a video game, uh, sorry, as with a movie, um, all of the work is done inside the player's head. They catch a glimpse of the thing and they're, they're putting in um, suggestions themselves or they're um, so scared already that they're just adding detail they're imagining what it might look like close up they're hearing the thing crawl around behind them sound is massively important whatever genre you're doing sound is massively important because it does that heavy lifting for you um, and you haven't had to render it and you haven't had to spend ages you know perfecting your camera shots or anything like that you you are just hinting and sketching and I think that's massively important a for visual scenes like that and or, or uh, auditory scenes like that but also in things like lore and worlds and those kind of things is sketching those things out and letting people fill in the blanks rather than dictating and laying out every piece of lore and history um i think it's very important and it leaves you places to go when you want to build out your stories as well mm. which i think is uh, yeah. fascinating i mean a, a good example of that um, of that horror moment of, uh, of somebody doing the work for us uh, was again the the, the, the horror uh, LARP game, um, God Rest You Merry, in which one of the ghosts visited a friend of ours who was asleep in bed. 
um, and she she's asleep. The room is dark, um, and then smoke starts pouring under the door, and she can hear uh, fire crackling outside the door, and she can see the red and um, uh, the red and yellow light going around the door. And it's obviously she wakes up, believing the place is in, uh, is is on fire, and then the door bursts open, smoke rolls into this room. This weird creature floats into the room, turns and looks at her, grins, and then floats back out of the room, and the door closes. So. Obviously, the smoke, the flames, all of that kind of thing is all fake um, effects. Um, and the thing was that that's the story she told us of what happened. But it can't possibly have happened because we built that puppet and its mouth doesn't move and it can't turn its head. But because she was so worked <laughs> up already and because she was maybe coming out of sleep or what have you and because of the sound and because of the smoke and whatever, she added all these extra bits to it. And, th- and she swears that's what she saw. But... But she didn't. And if we can provoke people into those moments of engagement and imagination, as I said, it doesn't need to be horror. Um, mm-hmm. And it it equally applies to video games. It applies to um, film. Um, it applies to books. That's why I like the written word so much, because you can suggest things in a line of text that you could spend years trying to render in a computer. So you got a lot of uh, effort into um, creating backgrounds for characters and creating visual uh, props and so on. Uh, What about um, the uh, other senses? Because the advantage of a live game uh, over a video game is that uh, you can engage multiple senses. Yes, and I think the the other senses, rather than just sight, are really important. So with Grimm, we had each of our ghosts had a signature scent and you can buy some amazing things in aerosol cans now. You can have Burnt Witch and wartime sewer or a wartime air raid Lovely. shelter um, and all sorts of really quite unusual smells uh, some pleasant some not and smell is really interesting because often your brain will pick up on it before you're consciously aware of the smell which is why it works so well to trigger memories and things so almost like a um film score where your characters have pieces of music that recur and will play in the background as they're as something's happening to them we could prime the players that something was going to happen or that something might be linked with a particular ghost by using smell um we also used hearing a lot um Unfortunately, this was the really early days of Bluetooth and wireless pillows, and the, the pillows that we planted in their bed didn't work well with a very poor wireless network and thick old house walls. But we were trying to use. Um, yeah, but we we managed to pull off a few other similar things, didn't we? So um, I wrote a, a speaker system where you could puppet sounds up and down a corridor, for example. So it, it so it's it was more like eight sound than quad sound. So you could run a, a finger over a um, over an iPad um, and have um, a ghost sort of drift gradually down the corridor in in terms of uh, and that was live. So you could chase people up and down. That was quite fun. Um, and similarly, speakers um, table. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Touch. That's right. Um, so, so uh, have you come across vibration speakers, which are basically turn a surface into a yes. uh, into a speaker kind of um, and make it rumble? Uh, so, if they're all sitting around the dining room table, obviously with their hands on the table, and they can feel this stuff happening, and they've got no idea why they can feel it happening. It's because we've hidden vibration speakers inside the candles. So. Um, uh, so yeah, as 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 you say, and as Rachel said, engaging every sense we possibly can, um, and these are things that you absolutely can't do in computer games. Sound, obviously, you can, but uh, but the others not so much. And another part of this is leaving space for the player's imagination to work. So it's back to imagination again. But one of the the players in that game, one of the characters, was a photographer. So we gave her a digital camera. We told her she could take photographs and develop them. And there was a dark room in the house, which was blacked off with red light and with a selection of drying photographs um, clipped to strings around it. Um, yeah, her camera was uh, was done up to look like a 1950s um, film camera. Yes. So she took her 24 photographs. She took her 
camera into the dark room to develop and and there two things happened the first was that we took the camera away we developed the pictures and added ghosts and lights and various supernatural things in the background that hadn't been there when we took the pictures um, but also we told her it would take two hours for the photographs to develop and because she didn't want anyone to tamper with the film she and another character sat in the dark room for two hours which enabled their imaginations to run riot because they were they were sat in an old house in a dark room just listening and waiting for things to happen so they had adrenaline levels which were sky high and were jumping at every sound and we didn't have to do anything to them because they were busy providing all the the spooks and jump scares themselves just by being left in an environment and their imaginations running wild oh that, that reminds me of another thing actually the um thinking about using all the senses the other thing we did this was 2015 um this this matters uh, for context um is we, we we hit this design issue, which was what do you do when all your ghosts are things like projections and puppets, when um, a player does decide to get too close? Um, how do we deal with that problem? And we introduced a, a, a pretty simple game mechanic stolen from various other games, which uh, very simple because we have um, referees around the place just to make sure things are okay. So the idea was if you hear um, this call of a drop, you drop to the ground and close your eyes. So we uh, we thought we'd we'd start that off as as how to stop somebody getting too close to a ghost, but we wanted to give them a bit, bit of an experience. So um, picture the scene: there is a, a an ethereal ghost floating down a corridor, and um, a player character who thinks that this ghost is related to them and wants to talk to the ghost takes a few steps too close, and a, a referee shouts, "Drop!" She closes her eyes and, and drops to the ground. Um, and then um, I go up to her and very quietly uh, say in her ear, right, keep your eyes closed, stand up, don't say anything, stand up, don't say anything, and come with me. So I walk her out of that corridor. There's no other players around at that point. Um, and we take her into a completely separate um, space in a separate building and tell her to keep her eyes closed, sit down. She sits down. And we say, right, you're going to feel something put over your head for a moment so um, don't panic or anything um, but when I tell you open your eyes you can't move um, your arms you can't move your lower body you can only move your head and she opened her eyes and now this was the oculus rift I think DK2 um, which we had one of um, and uh, so she opened her eyes into a fantastical world um, that we stole from somewhere else actually I'd, I'd intended um, I'd, I'd hoped that we could get around to writing a uh, our own sort of afterlife journey but we found something that was suitable and, and toyed with it a little bit but she opens her eyes and she's in this fantastical world and it's a, a journey through um, several uh, afterlives I suppose uh, and she's floating along and there's there's trees and then there's ice and there's lava and all sorts so um, obviously she can see this and we've put a soundtrack over so she can hear everything and as she gets into the ice place uh, Kira turns on the fan and so she can feel the cold breeze again across her and as she gets into the lava place Kira puts the fan heater on so suddenly she's being hit by hot air and then as she gets towards the end of the thing where she floats up into the air a bunch of us carefully lift the chair up <laughs> and carefully move <laughs> her up into the air float her around a bit to the end and then get her to close her eyes put it back down on the ground we haven't said a word really to her during all of this apart from brief instruction take the thing off her still with her eyes closed walk her back into the house and she lies back down and we say okay count to 10 and then you can wake up and then we just leave it there and and so for a start this was a player who'd never encountered the idea of vr which was just brilliant yeah. um and and secondly it was just the joy from our point of view of this player running into a room and going you'll never believe what's happened to me and she starts describing this stuff and of course, all the other players are going. Oh, this is cool! They've they've taken her to one side, and they've ex they've clearly briefed her on this thing that happened to her, or shown her some pictures or something. And she's going, "No, no, it really happened to me!" And it was just, yeah, amazing sort of curated experience. And again, one of these moments that that she'll always tell people about. Um, 
and yes, um, that sort of thing, that sort of surprise again. Because if we if we primed her for that, it would be a quite quite a different thing. But yeah, a good example of of using all the senses. Yeah, excellent. So mentioning VR, um, that that kind of ties in quite well with uh, the the future of the industry and uh, ways in which some of the tricks that you've described for live events might be applied to a virtual event or virtual experience. Yeah, I suppose so. I think working in VR is fundamentally, it's very different from um, working in uh, normal computer game design or working in, um, for example, making films. And unfortunately, a lot of the early VR was designed from those two perspectives. It was designed from, I'll just port a computer game, we'll do all the things that work in a computer game, or I'll just do a film and people can sit in VR and watch the film. And of course, that doesn't work because you can't do half of the cinematic tricks that we now use in computer games as well. So you can't uh, drag the camera to look at a particular thing. You're at the whim of the player. You can't control how fast they move through things not really um, and actually it's much more like um, designing for LARP um, funnily enough designing whole environments that you walk around in and it's it's very much like um, designing and writing for theatre um, you uh, particularly immersive interactive theatre things like punch drunk so it's 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 letting the player find their own speed through these spaces explore them as they want and letting them find the story rather than forcing it to go past them um, you know, dragging their attention a particular way. And there's lots of signposting and things from that, from LARP and from immersive theatre that, that, that you use that in a way that doesn't really fit traditional computer game design. So it's it's fascinating. Um, and it's fascinating to see it evolve, uh, really. Things like Half-Life Alex are, are, are pretty astounding. And even, you know, things like Vacation Simulator, that sort of thing, um, from their early iterations... Um, they, they're nailing this stuff now and it's it's really lovely to see because for a few years VR was just uh, an absolute mess of people getting it wrong, I guess. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's what you spend a lot of your time doing now, don't you, with, uh, as, as, your, as your job, uh, working on uh, different ways of uh, delivering uh, narrative and lore in, in video games. Yeah, that's right. I founded, uh, co-founded, and um, I'm a partner in a writing co-op uh, for um, video games and for other interactive experiences called Tailspinners. So we work with people like Frictional uh, and all sorts of different companies, actually, at all sorts of levels, helping out with anything from edit polishes through to entire game writing or voice direction or, or whatever it happens to be. And a lot of that, as you say, is about thinking about the character experience and how we deliver that in a way where um, it's not uh, you're putting a lot of work um, you're leaving a lot to their imagination let's put it that way yeah okay thank you Ian and Rachel where can people go to find out more about uh, you and your work Um, I blog on Medium so I'm on medium.com forward slash at rachel.wildwinter if you want to read about our events and the economics of LARP and how we make things work. To find out about Crooked House and the LARP events we've run, if you go to crookedhouse.org, you'll find pictures and information and links to other blog posts from both of us on that site. Yep, yeah, uh, like Rachel, I'm on uh, Medium as well, um, uh, username Wild Winter, and there's a whole bunch of various design articles on LARP and associated computer game um, bits and pieces. Um, and if you want to find out more about Tailspinners, um, where I do this sort of stuff for a living these days, uh, rather than, as Rachel said, uh, for just the love of it, uh, at uh, tailspinners.co.uk. Fantastic. And I'll pop some links into the show notes below uh, for everybody else. And uh, I've been Chris Payne for the Game Dev London podcast. We'll see you next week. Thank you very much. Thank you.